I'm going to introduce um, Bob Schiller, uh, my colleague Bob Schiller. Um, and uh, I've had the pleasure to do this a few times and uh, in, in a few different contexts. Um, I think uh, most of you um, know that Bob is a, a member of the faculty at Yale, a uh, Sterling professor in the economics department. He's also on the faculty at the Yale School of Management. And um, he's really one of the mm, strongest voices and an and advocate of thinking about the role that, that uh, finance can play in society in a positive way. Uh, finance can, uh, can go uh, many different directions. It's just a tool. It can be used for good or ill. And Bob has been thinking about, through much of his career, how to use that, how to develop tools and use those tools to make the world a better place. He's been thinking about the uh, big problems that families face in terms of uh, economic problems and proposed uh, a, a number of solutions. I think, um, for me, uh, the, the, the book that really surprised me uh, about the way Bob was thinking um, was his book on macro markets, which proposed a series of uh, financial instruments that could be uh, designed to protect families from the shock of a of a housing bubble, uh, from the shock of a of a uh, downdraft in the GDP of the country, um, and <clears throat> he's not only proposed these, he's been um, he, he has tried to make them uh, come true, and so um, uh, over the course of his career, he's been not just a theorist but a practitioner in uh, pushing forward this notion of, of finance for the benefit of society. Um, <clears throat> his book, uh, one of his, uh, I don't know if it's even it's his most recent book, but a, but a book that really fits the title of this, uh, or the intention of this conference, <clears throat> uh, is Finance and the Good Society, which um, really is a roadmap, if you will, for uh, how to understand the important positive developments uh, that, uh, that, is, that are happening in the world of finance. And, which direction we should think about taking uh, uh, financial development. <clears throat> uh, he's, of course, the, uh, uh, the winner of the 2013 Nobel um, uh, Medal in, in Economics, and that uh, brought yet more attention to his, uh, uh, his, um, his, his mission. Um, uh, and. Uh, so it didn't surprise us when that happened, but it's been a, a, an enormous um, boost to the notion of, of uh, the, the positive role that finance can play. Um, I think I'll stop there and, and let Bob speak for himself, but I want to welcome you and thank you very much for being part of this conference. <clears throat> okay. Well, I think it's a... Uh, long-standing Yale SOM tradition to talk about morality and society and purpose. But I want to try to combine it, as you said, Will, with the talk about innovation and the future. I'm, I'm going to try to do a big think talk um, that embraces our values and, our, um, and our ch the changes we can make. So um, I want to talk first about the the good society, uh, which is what's something that I, we need to, I, I believe that finance is a powerful tool for promoting the good society, if it's done right. Uh, I want to bring up behavioral economics, which is uh, economics that's more <coughs> broad than traditionally, that involves psychology and other social sciences. I'm going to define a bad equilibrium, a uh, fishing uh, equilibrium that will come back in a moment, uh, advocate the democratization of finance, making finance uh, work for everyone, and inclusive finance. Uh, but doing that is not easy. The finance is really a technology. It's a, a, it's a sort of a branch of engineering. Everything has to be experimented with, and it, you don't get the final product. You can't actually predict the future very well because innovation requires experimentation and adaptation to the results of experiments. Uh, human nature will surprise you and make things that seem like they would work not work, or conversely. 
And then I'm going to finally talk about some recent innovations and some wild ideas for I have for the future. Well, they're not wild. They just may sound wild. I think something analogous to them will happen. So uh, I wanted to say that a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, related to the two most recent books uh, I've had. Uh, one of them is a book, as you mentioned, Will, Finance and the Good Society. But I have another one with George Akerlof uh, coming out in two weeks. So my publisher doesn't want me to talk about it too much because <laughs> uh, we're hoping for reviews and the like coming out. So, But uh, I will talk a little bit about it. Uh, the title of our new book may seem a little odd. We're using the word phishing to refer to any manipulation and deception. Well, especially manipulation and deception that's done by big organizations that go viral and take it huge. It includes ordinary phishing, but it's, we think of it as something broader. Uh, a fool is uh, a person who doesn't really understand the extent of the phishing, <laughs> someone who gets caught. In it. So I, I, when listening to Wilbur Ross talk, I thought he gave a really good example of phishing. Uh, there's many little examples, so they all sound little individually, but they all add up to something big. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention, but I'm not sure I have exactly right that this is fishing. He told the story of the Dime Saving Bank on 42nd Street, and he said it had beautiful marble and mahogany and towering ceilings. Did I get that right? Uh, and uh, his mother was impressed by it and thought, this has to be where we put our money, all right? If that's all it is, it's phishing, right? Because it, you know, that goes into GDP, but is that a good thing? They're, maybe, I was thinking, they're doing it to deceive you because of the weird way some people think. You know, they're just impressed by wealth and ostentation. But then again, I thought more about it uh, since he's talked. And I'm not so sure that that's fishing. So I looked up the Dime Saving Bank in <laughs> uh, Wikipedia just minutes ago. The Dime Saving Bank was founded in 1859 during the saving bank movement. What was the savings bank movement? It was a philanthropic mov movement where philanthropists would give money to establish banks for small savers who had no place to put their money. And they were idealistic. So I don't really want to knock the, the dime savings bank as fishing. However, I just thought I would finish the story, which Wilbur Ross didn't finish. Whatever happened to the dime savings bank? Well, it was bought after 150 years in business as a semi-philanthropic institution. It was bought by WAMU. And they ran it for six more years into bankruptcy <laughs> in 2008. <laughs> so it's gone. Uh, <laughs> so there's something less than about fishing in there. But, um, so what is the good society? Uh, that's a term uh, that I found it goes way back. In, I did an engram search to see. Uh, the Google engrams allows you to see how words were used in the past. Uh, it really um, wasn't used much until 1936. This guy, Walter Lippmann, wrote a book called The Good Society. There were earlier uses of it, but they were uh, not the same. So what is the, go what is the good society? Well, what Lippmann says, we all have a vision for it. And the, uh, it's something about nice people <laughs> uh, helping each other. He said, you know what it is ultimately? It's the golden rule. And I'm quoting Jesus here. Do unto others. We don't usually do that, but I'll quote him here. <laughs> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But if you actually go to Matthew 7, 12 and read it, he's quoting somebody. Believe it or not, that's how things happen. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, as the prophets have said. So it goes back uh, earlier. Well, what Lippmann said is that every religion has the golden rule in it. Uh, so um, I can't see. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, this is quoting Lippmann. 
again, that there's something in, in human spirit about being nice, right? I mean, we don't want to live in a world where people are not nice. Uh, and then he goes and quotes various religions, uh, Hindu, Upanishads, that no man do to another that which is repugnant to himself. It's the same golden rule. And he finds it in Buddhism and, uh, and in Confucianism. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do unto others. He doesn't mention Islam, uh, but I, I can testify about that. I was just invited to give a talk at the G20 meetings, which this year are held in Turkey. So Turkey is the year, the Turkish presidency of the G20 nations. And they asked me to speak about Islamic finance. And I said, well, I'm not an expert. I, I grew up Christian. I don't know <laughs> Islamic finance. Um, they said, that's all right. We want you. So I read a little bit about Islamic finance, and I read a little of the Quran, and I decided the golden rule is there too. And this thing about Islamic finance, there's an idealism behind it, actually. That uh, uh, I, I think it is kind of a universal uh, sentiment. So we, um, uh, Lippmann says one place where you don't find it, the golden rule, is in fascism and communism, uh, which he said are eminently militaristic in uh, purpose and in spirit. Uh, so, um, uh, so yeah. So anyway, that's I'm, that's my next topic. But the idea is that finance seems to be selfish, uh, but in fact it shouldn't be, or at least there is. It has to take account of human nature, and there's a selfish. I'll come back to that. There's a selfish side to human nature, but there's also a generous side, and that's what we have to think. Uh, behavioral finance is a revolution we've seen for the last 20 years, and it's particularly strong here at Yale at SOM. Uh, and uh, but it, it's reacting against an attitude that developed in much of economics that. Let's regard people as utility maximizers, and the utility is their own utility. Uh, we have been going through a revolution which is realizing that's not quite true. Uh, it's not new, though. This is uh, the opening line from Adam Smith's other book. Now, remember, remember, Adam Smith, in 1776, published a book called The Wealth of Nations, which was an advocacy of free markets. He said, uh, you don't thank the uh, generosity. You don't attribute what the butcher, the baker, and the brewer does for you as their generosity. They did it as a trade. We have to recognize that's a reality. We need markets, and we need uh, people to pursue their self-interest, which ends up being, in an orderly framework, everyone else's interest. So Adam Smith is regarded as a staunch supporter of free markets. And yet, in his other book, which is much less read, he starts out the book by saying people are not completely self-interested. So I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's obviously wrong to think that people are completely self. It's totally wrong to think that people are completely selfish. So we have to rethink our theory. This is uh, my t I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, and I took his course. I still remember him. Kenneth Boulding, in his presidential address to the American Economic Association, he said, the theory that people care only about themselves and that there is neither malevolence or benevolence in anywhere in the system is demonstrably false. Anything less descriptive of the human condition can hardly be imagined. So we're coming back to reality and recognizing that people have multiple purposes. They, they are selfish at times, and we have to understand that, but not generally. Now, there's a word, empathy, which I like to trace the history of, which goes back to a book by the Theodore Lips uh, called Leitfaden der Psychologie, uh, which was published in 1906 and translated in 1909. And the translator, Robert Titchener, said, well, there's no English word for Einfühlen, which uh, incidentally was coined uh, essentially by uh, Lips. Uh, 
So he invented the word empathy. So you don't see it in an engram search until bang, it appears in 1909. So what is empathy? Uh, this is, um, it goes beyond sympathy. It's uh, the ability to experience the, the thoughts, emotions, and direct experience of others. So um, it's a feeling of care and understanding for the suffering, or you are suffering too. Uh, so I think that uh, th we are starting to appreciate this aspect of human nature more. Now, there's another uh, word which has just appeared into the English language. Uh, and this guy coined it, uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti, who is a neuroscientist. And he noticed that when a monkey sees you picking up a peanut, monkeys have empathy too. Maybe less, but they have some empathy. When, uh, that the neuron that would be involved in the monkeys picking up the peanut fires just as if the monkey were picking up a peanut. So it's clear that the monkey is kind of sympath empath what? sympathetic, empathetic to you in a sense. He, he's kind of visual. He's looking at you, and he's thinking, he's going to pick up that peanut. And in his mind, he's doing it too. That's, uh, that's empathy. Uh, or when someone's throwing a basketball to make a uh, penalty shot, you kind of, you, you almost feel your arms going up like you would do it too. So we're like all one, uh, one species. And, um, well, this is uh, engram. I love engrams. I'm always looking up everything on engram. But it, it tells you how often a word or phrase has been used in books in history. So you can see empathy, bang, starts in 1909, nowhere before that. Mirror neuron is just starting to catch on. And I bet it's going to zoom up over the next century, uh, just like empathy did, because it's a reality of our life. So uh, now the, the nice thing to recognize about uh, the good society is that while we share feelings and empathy with each other, we all have different goals and different purposes. It's important that we, that we satisfy these goals. We, we make it a place where people can satisfy their own goals. Uh, so I have a theory about the word finance. The etymology of it. Have you ever thought about that? Where did the word finance come from? Well, the dictionary says it comes from finis, the Latin word for end. That used to be the word that you'd see at the end of books. When you reach the last page of the book, it would say finis, you know, if you're reading in Latin. Uh, and uh, so why was that the name of finance? Well, one book said it's because when they completed a financial contract and it was done, they would write finis in big letters across it, meaning done. Uh, but I have another theory. Who knows why it became the name for finance? If you go back to a Latin dictionary, the word finis had two meanings. One was the end, like the end of a book. And the other one was the end, like the purpose of something. So uh, I thought, maybe that's the other meaning. The word end in English has the same two meanings, right? The end the end of a ride or the end that I'm interested in. So I think I'll call it that. So finance is really the uh, technology for allowing people to achieve their goals. This is the fundamental idea. Now, in order to, to achieve, most goals are not achievable by one person alone. You have to have an organization. And the organization has to encourage people somehow to merge their private purposes into the organization's purposes for it to succeed. And that's what finance does. It incentivizes people also to protect them against risks of failure of the organization so they can plunge wholeheartedly into the organization and do what it uh, is trying to do. Um, but the problem is, as, as uh, uh, Wilbur Ross alluded, is that uh, it often seems that finance is evil. Uh, it's uh, trade. A lot of it, people are annoyed by trading. <laughs> they, feel, they find people trading against others is keeping secrets. Uh, I wouldn't, shouldn't I be generous and tell my knowledge to other people, let them benefit from it? Uh, but I think uh, the, 
By the way, another thing, ugly thing about finance, going back thousands of years, money lenders had to get rough sometimes. You lend money to someone, and the person has bad turn of luck, comes back to you and says, I can't pay. I need an extension on my loan. And you know he might be lying or uh, playing a trick. So you have to get tough. And back in those days, it was really tough. If you go back, the person might say, if you don't pay me in two uh, months, I will take your wife as my slave, that sort of thing. So finance got a really bad reputation. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was um, proscribed by the, the Catholic Church, the Islamic re re religion, etc. Uh, but uh, so that's what I. Th that's part of where this Islamic finance came from which is uh, still much in my mind because I just got back last week from a conference. Uh, so, but I, I think that what we have to think of is a, a finance can a channel and corral these emotions that people have that are not always social. It's like a sports game. You, you have a referee, that's the regulator, or it could be a private regulator, like a Better Business Bureau. And then you have uh, rules, and you play the game for a while. And after the game, you uh, have fun together. So it has to be channeled. That, but, but this aggressive impulse is part of what makes people do great things. So we don't want to pretend that we can get rid of it. We can't get rid of it. So now in our book, uh, Akerlof and I, uh, Fishing for Fools, uh, we emphasize a fishing equilibrium. This is what happens as a result of free markets, that uh, you get <coughs> a sense that you have to do various tricks, like have the mahogany and the marble in your lobby, even though it's wasteful expenditure. You've got to do it because that's uh, part of business. And everyone else does it. Uh, well, they set some limits, but sometimes the limits involve uh, things that are not uh, ideal. But civil society has set up institutions, government and private institutions, that limit uh, fishing. And what, I, what my book with Akerlof is is substantially a history of this. So don't ever imagine that any successful society was completely free market. Uh, it wouldn't work. There'd be, uh, and you can see, you see historical examples of the problem. But we've actually achieved a miracle of economic growth. And I think it's spreading around the world. This uh, half century is going to be regarded as a major turning point uh, all over the world as we have more. It's really a financial success. We have more successful achievement of goals through things like ownership right, division into shares, incentive contracts, uh, price discovery, risk management. So, uh, but it also brings with it certain problems. And these are what we, Akerlof and I call, no one could possibly want. Uh, personal financial instability, financial and macroeconomic instability, obesity and addictions, uh, and bad government, <coughs> government driven by commercial interest lobbyists. These are problems today uh, that remain in our system and have to be ironed out. So I'm emphasizing that we will have, we, we need constant innovation. The innovation has to recognize that people are complex psychological animals. We need a civil society that recognizes these foibles and the potential uh, for exploitation. We, we need lobbyists. Lobbyists represent people's interest. Uh, it's lawmakers can get very uh, clumsy in what they do. They have to hear both sides of any story. I think we need better balanced lobbyists. We need more lobbyists representing low income uh, people. Uh, so the, the, uh, the financial crisis that we saw starting in 2007 was in part due to f failures of our institutions. Uh, we saw the, the financial system was systemically fragile. We saw Dodd-Frank. Uh, um, trying to make adjustments to protect us against this kind of crisis. 
Wilbur Ross did not seem to have a, a charitable conclusion about Dodd-Frank. Uh, I think of it as just an incremental innovation which involves something good, like the C Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which he didn't have kind words for. Um, but I think it is uh, uh, do fulfilling a useful function. Uh, so, um, uh, so there is a th the reaction to the financial crisis is mixed. Uh, a lot of people say they're angry that we didn't throw anybody in jail for the financial crisis, uh, and I think my own attitude for that is. There isn't, uh, some people went to jail, like Bernie Madoff, but we don't blame the crisis on him. Uh, uh, I think there, there isn't an option of throwing people in jail for doing things that were legal, if uh, uh, misguided. And we just haven't found that the crisis was particularly caused by people doing clearly illegal things. So we can't throw people in jail. Uh, so it's a little bit like um, uh, an analogy to the causes of the crisis. I, you ever had the experience of driving at night in foggy or slippery conditions on an expressway, and you're thinking, you know, I, I think I'd like to slow down, but that might be an obstacle. Everyone else, they're all going pretty fast, so I'd better go pretty fast too, uh, because I'll be an obstacle and a hazard if I don't. But I feel uncomfortable about this. Well, that's the story of the years preceding the financial crisis. Uh, we, uh, now, throwing people in jail doesn't necessarily, you could have traffic cops stop people on the highway and uh, put them in handcuffs and haul them away. But that's not appropriate for this kind of problem. So I think what we're getting to is more elaborate systems of, of interacting with drivers. Now we have uh, uh, technology that can measure the speed of cars and can interact and help uh, give feedback to drivers and coordinate them. So eventually, we're going to have driverless cars. Um, the theme that I wanted to emphasize was democratizing finance, making it useful to everyone. And here I'm back to Turkey. I was impressed by the Turks and the Islamic finance people. Uh, the government of Turkey uh, announced as its themes its recommended themes for the G20 meeting were uh, inclusiveness, implementation, and investment. What they're saying, in, uh, it's, it's really enlightened, I think, to bring this up uh, for an international conference. It's about including everyone, minorities as well. I, I met Erdem Bashchi, uh, who is the uh, uh, governor of the Central Bank of Turkey. And he said he likes, instead of saying Islamic finance, let's call it participatory finance. You might see this in the final uh, G20, if, if Turkey manages to get it in, to the final G20 communique in November. Uh, I don't think the countries of the world would be, cons would be sympathetic to putting Islamic finance <laughs> into their communique. But participatory finance, maybe. That, that's, that's what we want, I think. So. Um, uh, so I wanted then to um, talk about some ideas, uh, some of them uh, recent innovations and some of them uh, future innovations. Uh, and some of them are my book and some of them are, are elsewhere. But let me, t the, the first thing that comes to my mind to say is that, again, I'm throwing out ideas that might have to be changed or altered, but I think the government should expand its subsidy for personal financial advisors for lower income people. We already heard Wilbur Ross allude to this, that the small community banks were thought to be more friendly and uh, giving uh, helpful advice. Uh, and now he said, but that's, a, didn't he say, I don't know exactly, it's expensive to do that. Uh, we can't do that for everyone. I'm not sure I'm quoting him exactly, but. Uh, well, there currently is a subsidy for financial advice. It's a tax deduction, but you don't get it unless you itemize. So who's getting this subsidy? It's high-income people, not low-income people. I think that there should be a subsidy for financial advisors, not all financial advisors, financial advisors who will sign an oath of loyalty to their client. 
and refused to steer them for commissions. So uh, we, we could do that subsidy as a tax credit or there could be some other form. Now there's already this kind of thing somewhat. You know, law schools uh, send their students to uh, 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 community law uh, free advice centers. There's the citizens' advice bureaus in the UK, some of them in the US. These are done by philanthropists. But, uh, either way, by philanthropists or the government, <clears throat> people need help and they need personal help. At this point, we don't have artificial intelligence done well enough yet to substitute for real human attention. Now here's an example of something that uh, has happened already. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the benefit corporation. This slide actually shows three similar ideas. The public benefit corporation is a corporation created by a state to fulfill a public purpose. Canadian National Railway was an example, but that's gone. That's now privatized. But how about Metro North? Have you heard of that? That's a public benefit corporation. But a benefit corporation, the, the names are kind of confusing because they sound similar. A benefit corporation is a new idea of a corporation that has written into its charter a public purpose. Uh, and then they are obligated, but it's also for profit. It has conflicting goals, you might say. Make profit for the stockholders and fulfill a public purpose. Uh, this uh, was first created in the United States in 2010, just five years ago, in Maryland. Uh, a, a certified B Corp is a corporation that the nonprofit B Lab certifies as operating in the public benefit. Uh, so these are all different examples. But I think the, um, the benefit corporation is the one I'm going to focus on. Uh, so uh, there's a website that shows the, how, how uh, benefit corporations have spread in the last five years from Maryland to Connecticut and to the whole northeast of the United States. And actually, 31 of the 50 states now have benefit corporation laws. So here, I mean, here's the simple idea. You set up a company, you define it as a benefit corporation, and then you choose what the finis is. What is the goal besides making money? You put it into the charter. Now, critics say, well, that's confusing. Now the company has two goals. It should just be making profits. The theory here is that it creates a more idealistic environment, a different social environment that might ultimately uh, make for better success. I think of Yale University. It's a nonprofit, but it could be a benefit corporation. But one reason why this and other universities are so successful is because we people here who work here have some sense of public purpose. This isn't about just making money. Uh, and this can be embodied with new institutions that, um, uh, okay, so benefit corporations emphasize a stated purpose, but the government doesn't tell you what the purpose is. Now other countries, like Germany has a corporate law that requires that members of labor, representatives of labor be put on the board. So that presumably encourages some idealistic uh, people-oriented management. But the government is specifying the purpose. The government shouldn't specify the purpose because it, it's, it's going to be clumsy in doing that. It should be the, the founders of the company define its purpose. Crowdfunding is another recent example, which I, I don't know where it's going. It's, it's, uh, but the idea is to involve people in, uh, uh, this is inclusive finance, involve people in sorting through uh, investment possibilities. We have already have Kiva.org and Kickstarter.com. They're already important innovations, uh, but um, uh, yet to see their full potential. The Jobs Act of 2012 was supposed to facilitate crowdfunding, but I don't know that it's really reached its potential yet. Uh, <clears throat> now here's an idea from my book, uh, Goods Finance and the Good Society. I think we have to explore variations on a theme. So this is another variation on a benefit corporation, uh, but it's for a strictly nonprofit. Let's say uh, hospitals or um, uh, schools could be set up as a participation nonprofit. The idea is the, the, the company gets money by selling shares 
instead of asking for donations. And uh, the, the, um, the shares are carrying dividends. They pay dividends. But the dividends go into a nonprofit trust. The point, so, so if you buy shares in a participation nonprofit, you have voting rights for the organization. It's like a corporation. You get dividends, but you cannot spend the dividends on yourself. Uh, this, I, I don't have really time to explain the motivation for that, but it's something about bringing people together who have some idealistic feeling, some idea that they want to get involved, some concern that if I give money to this charity, I don't have any vote in what they're doing, I, I, you know, I, and, then I, and then it's gone, my money is gone. So giving money to a charity should involve rights and uh, involvement. That's the idea. Um, another idea is continuous workout mortgages. The idea of having mortgages as we do now that have no pre-planned workout could be changed. During the financial crisis, a lot of homeowners defaulted on their mortgage, and they came running to the bank saying, I can't pay. Then the bank might give them a workout or might not. It's uncertain. Nobody knows in advance. Why don't we plan it in advance? I was uh, proposing that one form this might take is to automatically reduce the mortgage balance if the value of the homes in your neighborhood declines. Uh, why not? I mean, uh, you're, you, you've got less money now. This is risk management for homeowners. Uh, it's more like owning partnership and owning a home between you and the lender. You both take some of the risk of the home price falling, as they did during the financial crisis. In order to make that happen, we should also have futures and options markets for real estate so that the lender can spin off the risk, can hedge against the risk that it entails by issuing a continuous workout mortgage. Now, this one we actually managed to succeed. My colleague Carl Case and I, uh, with uh, well, we created a home price index. Uh, it's Case Schiller Home Price Index, and they're now traded since 2006 at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. These would have allowed. Now, incidentally, they are trading, but not very much. Somehow, it, it surprised me. There's so much interest in real estate. Why wouldn't they want to trade on a futures market? Nobody really knows these questions. You know, what the, what the futures exchanges do is they, they experiment. They try something, and most of their experiments fail. They never know why they fail. Somehow it didn't see, feel right to people. So it, but it's still going. It's been going for almost 10 years now. And one of these days it might take off. <laughs> we hope so. The other one that Will mentioned is I think that government should be uh, issuing government debt tied to GDP rather than fixed interest. Uh, the financial crisis was substantially caused by, well, let's take Greece as an example. Their GDP fell by 25%, and they have all this debt, which is it's not uh, adjusted for their failure. Uh, why shouldn't the debt be tied to GDP? Uh, so you could sell shares in GDP. My colleague, uh, Mark Kamstra, and I, he's from uh, Canada, uh, Propose we call them trills. How about selling one trillionth shares of GDP? Uh, so if you bought one share of the United States, uh, you would be getting about, what, $16 a year now. And it would go up or down <laughs> with the success of this country. Uh, and then oh, I was, uh, there's many other things. Insurance against home values, weather insurance. Weather, weather insurance is happening on an increasing scale. Livelihood insurance is insurance for careers. Inequality insurance is what I call it is a plan for the government to insure against a rise in inequality. I think one of the biggest worries about this wonderfully growing world economy now is that it will get much more unequal, especially with rapidly growing information technology. So we, we should take into account what uh, psychologists uh, Lieberman and Trope have argued, that people are idealistic more about the distant future. And if not now, I can't be idealistic today. I, mean, I, I need money today, but I'll give it away in the future. So let's decide on a plan to deal with inequality in 10 or 20 years if, as we worry, it could get really bad, much worse than today. 
so that's the future I'm talking about. You can see that some of these ideas that I've thrown out are a little bit uh, far off, like inequality <laughs> insurance. Um, I haven't had my phone ringing from congressmen about <laughs> actually passing a law like this. But one of these days, it will happen. That's how innovation happens. You, I'm glad we're having a conference on uh, the future of finance. You start talking about things, and it's, it happens 20, 50, or even 100 years in the future. But it does happen, and 100 years goes by much faster than you think. OK. <laughs> So, our uh, questions. Questions? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Thank, I don't thank see where you are, but uh, <laughs> oh, there you are. I'm up here. My, my business partner likes to sit in the back row, so I went along with oh, him. Okay. Um, uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, Professor Schiller, for all your contributions and for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm Bill Feingold, Yale College 85, and uh, um, my partner is George Chuang, uh, SOM 95. And uh, what I wanted to just uh, get your feedback on, uh, I was here for my 30-year reunion in May, and we were having a conversation, uh, a friend of mine who was a very successful money manager, and I've worked in, the, uh, in Wall Street for most of my career, and somebody who was very anti-finance. Three of us were talking, and I described, I gave this definition of finance, and I wanted to sort of offer it to you and get your thoughts on it, is uh, using money or things like money to connect today with tomorrow. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to offer one other thing for your um, talk about people being malevolent or, or not. I once worked for someone uh, who uh, reprimanded me because in a, in a meeting with uh, investors, I gave an honest opinion of the market. And when wow. he reprimanded me for it, uh, and I told him I wanted to be credible, he said, he asked me, would you rather be respected or rich? So I thought I would leave you with that for <laughs> your fishing and whatnot. But again, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I think most people ardently want both, <laughs> right? Re re respected and rich. You raise an interesting issue about how to talk publicly. Uh, so I was confronted with this problem uh, last, late last month when the stock market fell dramatically and I was on television. And I tend to worry more than most people about the stock market. I have a stock market price earnings ratio that called CAPE that I uh, suggest the market is overpriced. And I also have questionnaire surveys that the Yale School of Management is running now uh, of individual and institutional investors asking them questions about their confidence. And I find that, uh, we find that confidence in the valuation of the market has fallen a lot uh, since uh, well, is it, it's lower than it's been since 2000, which was the major turning point for the market. So there I was on television <laughs> talking. Uh, it sounds kind of negative. Uh, harshly. But then again, I don't know. The market could go soaring up from here. So it, 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 I, had, I ended up trying to choose my words very carefully. So what I said is I could easily see the Dow falling to 11,000 in the next year or two. But I really don't know. <laughs> it might go way up. <laughs> but saying that turns out to it was quoted a lot, like as if that's all I, the, the word eleven thousand, as if that's all I said. Uh, so, so it, it, it inclines some people to be just meticulously careful and say nothing. But I think it was a good thing. I thought I was doing something moral, raising the possibility that we could be at Dow eleven thousand in a year. I think that's uh, within, or certainly by two years. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a problem with business, is that you, uh, especially when you're part of a, I, I feel freer to talk as a university professor than as a member of some business organization, or a member of the Federal Reserve, uh, for example. <laughs> or after the um, financial crash, I went back to look at Federal Reserve working papers 
and I did a search over all of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors working papers. I did a search for housing bubble, okay? <laughs> and I found only one working paper that had mentioned housing bubble <laughs> out of their thousands of working papers. So I called up the author and I said, uh, you did it great. You actually talked about the housing bubble from the Federal Reserve. But then I said, why did you take it back at the end of the article? <laughs> at the end of the article, he said, well, but, uh, it looks like there might be a bubble, but we should be very careful. And he kind of took it back. And I asked him why. And uh, he, didn't, he seemed very uncomfortable and didn't want to talk. So I have a sense that, you know, if you're a member of the Federal Reserve, the word bubble is something you don't say carelessly. <laughs> <laughs> but we can say it, right? And, Um, I'm in the class of 2017. My name is Andres Martinez. Uh, I have a question about the innovations that you spoke about. Uh, it was clear from Mr. Ross's speech and from my finance background that wealth managers will never have incentives to advise low-income people. So you talk about uh, subsidies for advisors for low-income people. Right. Uh, many times those advisors don't have the expertise because in an ever more complex financial market, uh, it's, it's getting hard to be even a wealth manager nowadays. Um, so my question is, with the rise of robo-advisors, all these automatic technological advisors for small net worth individuals, do you think that such a policy, such as subsidizing uh, advisors, will be necessary, or will the free market take care of it Maybe, uh, by himself? Yeah. When you talk about robo-advisors doing what I think low-income people need, talking to them and, w and clearing up their thinking and reminding them of dangers and obligations, uh, when the, when the robo-advisors get that good, I think there are other problems that low-income people will face. Uh, so I am worried about what they used to call technological unemployment. There was just a news story. Uh, in the last week about uh, migrant farm workers. Did you see this? That the number of migrant farm workers being hired, oh, it was blueberries, wasn't it? It was about, anyone see this article? Blueberries used to be picked by hand by migrant farm workers, but now they have a way of, of automatically picking most of them, and the, farm wor the migrant workers just go around and get the last, that's what it sounded like. Uh, so what, 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 are, what are migrant farm workers going to do in this future that you talk about? Uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a big first order problem that isn't being talked about. Now, I also think that that problem is actually in the backs of minds of a lot of people. And a lot of people are worried about what, what am I going to be doing in 10, 20, 30 years? Or uh, what is my teenage son going to be doing? <laughs> I'm pointing at Wahid, who told me he's 15 years old. <laughs> what are you going to be doing? In, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> in 30 years. Uh, well, uh, I'm not particularly pointing at you. Uh, what about someone who isn't good at uh, school? And uh, I don't know what they'll be doing. So I, th I think that this ought to be a time of discussion about it. Now, we've had important revolutions in the past, like Social Security was an invention of, uh, of the German government in the 1880s, uh, or was it 1870s, that uh, provided insurance against uh, a bad turn of fortune in old age. So we need to keep thinking along lines like that, uh, because I think that this might be a, uh, a bad outcome coming. If, it, if we don't know yet, it's still insurable. You can't insure a house after it burns down. Let's think about it before it. One more question. Hi, Professor Shiller. My name is Priya. I'm in the executive MBA class of 2017. Thank you for the great talk. I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience right now. So <laughs> to add on to the last question and what you just said, and Wilbur Ross made a comment that uh, governments favor borrowers instead of savers. 
So is there something that you think that can be done to change that culture as, you know, can, can businesses, banks, uh, educational institutions do something to promote a culture of saving which might actually help low-income people as well and just yeah. overall culture of saving? Well, there's, a, there, there's an emerging development economics literature on this. Uh, so, for example, Dean Carlin here at Yale has done experiments with low-income people in emerging countries about what will help them save. Uh, there are other, uh, th this is a behavioral issue. In some countries, the low-income people may save too much. In China, for example, the saving rate has been like 25 percent. And maybe that's too much. Maybe they should uh, uh, spend more on today. Uh, so it's difficult. But there are various proposals. And I, I think of this as a, 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 f a good area for young researchers to dis explore. Uh, for example, uh, Shlomo Benarzi and Richard Thaler have a, what they call a Save More Tomorrow plan. It's a little bit analogous to my uh, inequality plan. Get, people find it difficult to save today. <laughs> okay. If you say, you should increase your saving to 20% of your income today, they'll say, I couldn't possibly do that. I have all these bills and uh, uh, mortgage payments, whatever. I can't do it. But if you say, well, you should do it later when your income is higher, maybe next year or a little. So there, the Save More Tomorrow plan was a plan you'd sign up for that would automatically deduct your paycheck as your income grew. And so you never even get the money. It goes into savings <laughs> automatically. And this has been experimented with, and it's proven to work. So I, I think that there's a, it's an interesting time to be, there's a lot of good research topics on how to do this. But it does take innovation. It does take experimentation. Okay, thanks once again. Okay.